Shabbat Shalom and welcome to Olive Tree Community Spokane. The following recording is from this week's teaching on the Parsha or portion from the Torah. You can find more details on this Parsha and the scripture being referred to in the pull down menu below. Now let's join our teacher as he shares his insights from the scriptures. I'm going to open up real quick in prayer. So, Father, I just ask in Yeshua's name that you'll uh, help the words that I say be your words. Well, most of them are going to be your words because it's going to be right from the text uh, and then my comments. But let those comments be uh, fruitful and uh, pleasing to you. I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay. So we started off, and you heard some of this already, but uh, in Numbers chapter 19, uh, which is where our text is, and it's huchat, or I also call it regulation. Um, Adonai said to Moses and Aaron, this is the regulation from the Torah, which Adonai has commanded. And he says, tell the people of Israel to bring you a young red female cow without fault or defect and which has never borne a yoke. So this cow basically had no stress. It was nice and happy and perfect in every manner that's possible. Well, this cow has um, become known as the red heifer. Some versions will actually call it the red heifer. Um, but it has to be completely burned up. Completely burned up to ashes. So nothing is left but the ash. And as it's being burned, they add these three things Three, three, three things: uh, cedar wood, hyssop, and uh, a scarlet yarn, or some people's versions might say crimson thread. Uh, and these all have purpose because everything God does has purpose. Uh, my guess is that the cedar wood has a uh, pleasing, maybe fragrant aroma. I, I, I think wood smells good when it's burning most of the time. I like barbecues, you know. Uh, but the crimson yarn, the thread is kind of like the, the heifer's red. And the hyssop, well, they use that normally when they sprinkle, right? They sprinkle people with this hyssop stuff. So anyway, so these ingredients do have, uh, they're symbolic in many ways. So they take the ashes. And what's kind of unique is uh, anybody who touches the ashes is, is clean, but then they become unclean, right? So they take these ashes and they... Uh, they take them a distance away from the uh, the living area where they are at, and they are waiting for the necessary moment, right? Because the necessary moment, it becomes necessary when someone becomes unclean. And the unclean or sin at this point is uh, based on the fact that um, they touched something dead or it came real close to them and it made them uh, impure, uh, so it's kind of a sin to become unclean, to come in contact with a dead person. Um, and ways that you can become unclean uh, with a dead person is, uh, and here's like the top of the list, um, you enter a tent, right? And in this tent, there's somebody who's dead. Um, so for those of you who like to just open people's doors and walk in their house, you know, <laughs> here's, you better knock, before you go into that tent, because guess what? If you enter the tent, you're going to become part of this unclean party for seven days also, because <laughs> you walked in the tent. So now you're unclean also. So knock before you enter is a good. Uh, also, a touch in a corpse in a field. You know, you maybe you find somebody in the field and you're like, hey, are you okay? Uh-oh, you're not okay. You just touched the corpse and now you have to tell them, I got to get cleanse you know the three day and the seven days and or you pick up a bone i'm gonna guess that's a human bone but it could be a bone of anything but a bone of a person i guess uh, or you touch a grave um and that's probably one of the reasons why they used to you know you heard the term whitewashed tombs you know they they made them obvious so you didn't walk on them or touch them and uh, it was a helpful way to stay clean <laughs> so watch out for the tombs as well and uh, so this rule, this huchat, which uh, basically meant you spend seven days, right? Seven days and uh, you're unclean. So the third day you get sprinkled, the seventh day you get sprinkled, and then you wash. And at the end, at the end of the day, 
you're okay. You can join the community again. Uh, if you don't do this, right? If you don't, especially if people know it, <laughs> but if you don't do this, then you should know this is something that if you don't do this, well, you remain unclean. Okay, that's the big thing, right? Is you want to get clean. Uh, but you defile the tabernacle, God's sanctuary. Um, and then you get cut off from Israel. I don't know if you are, are like me and you heard this term cut off, right? Well, a lot of people try to say, well, that means that you just go away or or you get killed. Or a lot of times when it says cut off, then God dealt with you in a serious way. So I don't know if that means God dealt with you, like took you away, took you out, <laughs> but being cut off, you don't want to have that happen. So, um, but it's also a reminder uh, to us that our physical body is the temple for his spirit. And we don't want to do things that would, um, you know, make this temple uh, defiled or unclean, which was one of the things that happens if you don't uh, participate in this sprinkling Okay. All right. So let's move on to Numbers uh, 1919. Um, it's uh, a text that tells us a person who's clean. Okay. They start out, they're clean. Uh, they can administer the ash mixture with the water. Um, they do this on the third day and the seventh day, but this clean person becomes unclean until the end of the day. But just in contact with this, it's kind of a unique thing, right? This, you start out clean to use something to help somebody become clean, and then now you're unclean. <laughs> it just, it's one of those, it begs a question, I guess. Okay, but we'll get to the question near the end of this. Okay, so, and sad things happen, right? In chapter 20, it starts off with Miriam dies in the Zin desert and is buried, right? Well, I don't know how many people participated in that little moment for Miriam, but now guess what? They have these ashes and water. They get to, they get to do the uh, three day, seven day. Uh, they're all unclean because they dealt with her body. I don't think she just buried herself, right? So people participated in that ceremony. Um, you would think that that was enough, right? To just get people solemn and maybe, uh, I don't know, mindful of God and let's be happy or something, right? But no, 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 no. Because right after that in... Uh, the next verse in uh, chapter 20, verse 2, uh, guess what? We're out of water again. <laughs> oh, that's not a good thing to run out of water because what happens when they run out of water? Let's assemble against Moses and Aaron, and they start complaining. You know, the complaining just doesn't, you know, one couple minutes or two, it grew and it kept growing to the point where they basically are pointing fingers and saying, why did you make us leave Egypt? You know, we had everything, right? We had all the food we could want. We had the water. We had so much. Yeah, they, they treated us terrible. But man, we had stuff there. Uh, not good, right? So, <laughs> but once again, uh, our trusted leaders, you know, Moses and Aaron, they they took it well. You know, they did. They ran to Adonai. They fell on their faces at the tent of meeting. What are we supposed to do? They're going to kill us for... Why did we, you know, okay, so what does he tell them? You know, he tells them, um, well, the glory of Adonai appeared. I mean, that's a pretty big thing. So he tells them these instructions, and, and this is, I would say it's pretty easy. You know, some things could be difficult, you know, like, but it's easy. He says, take your staff, you know, go up to the place where the staff's hanging out there, grab your staff. Assemble the community, you and Aaron, your brother, and before their eyes, tell the rock to produce its water. I mean, that sounds easy, right? Just tell it. You will bring them water out of the rock and thus enable the community and their livestock to drink. Okay, well, I would have just said, all right, that sounds pretty easy. But by this point, he's not on a good roll here. He's starting to roll the wrong way. In fact, he's getting, I don't know what it was like for him. <laughs> you know, things, things just weren't great. His sister died, you know, and uh, he, he finds out later his brother's going to die. But before that happens, he, uh, like, 
wasn't supposed to go like this because if he just followed those easy, easy instructions, God would have had a wonderful moment, but no, he didn't tell the rock to do that. He didn't. So he's in front of this rock. He's in front of the entire assembly. And he says something pretty harsh, you know, listen, you rebels, <laughs> you rebels. Are we supposed to bring you water from this rock? You rebels. And he didn't hesitate. I mean, he's sitting there. He's got the staff in his hand. He raises the hand with the staff. Bunk, hits the rock. Not once. Twice. Two times. He smacks the rock. Now, I, I know if you've been you know, a, a Bible reader, if you're a student of the word, you'll learn and you'll already know that that rock we find out Paul mentions it, it was Yeshua <laughs> and he followed them through the desert, this rock. So without hesitation, he smacks the rock. All right. So you say, well, what went wrong, right? Water still flowed from the rock. No big deal. Everybody was satisfied. Everybody. Nope. Not Adonai. And he was not satisfied, not at all. He says, you did not trust in me. He's telling Moses this, so that I would be regarded as holy by my people? Okay, guess what? You are not going to bring my people into the land I'm giving them. Well, you can't take that back, can you? That little striking of the rock thing. He wished, probably wished, ah, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> please forgive me, <laughs> but nope, you're not going to take them to the land now. Well, time goes on, and now mind you, they're through this Parsha, they're doing a lot of traveling, and they're encountering kings, and they're, and they're terrible stuff's going on, but some good stuff happens out of all that as well. But they get to Edom, okay, if anybody knows a little bit about Edom, you know, go back to Uncle Esau, right? <laughs> and Edom is where it's kind of like they're distant relatives, right? The Israel, right? They're probably like, hey, our brothers go way back, right? And uh, can we pass through? You know, we're not going to take anything. We won't even drink water. But if we get thirsty, we'll, you know, uh, we'll stay on the king's highway, right? We're not going to mess with anything, right? Just please let us go through. No. <laughs> so the king of Edom's like, no, you're not going to go through my land. So now they have to go the long way. Well, I don't know how long, but I, I, I've looked at a map. It's kind of like down over, and, up, and it's kind of like their land must have had a pretty big border, but they couldn't go through the land. Uh, so now they're probably even more upset, right? We got to go around, and what? why couldn't we be on good terms with Edom? And well, oh, sorry. All right, that, there's a pause here because now God's telling Moses, your brother is going to go the way of his fathers. <laughs> he's not going to, he's not going to stay alive anymore, but we have to do something about this, right? You know, remember I told you, because you guys didn't regard me as holy, things are going to happen. Well, it happened much quicker for Aaron. So he tells him, take Aaron, take his son, El Azar, and ascend mount hor okay so mount hor is known as the place where aaron dies so he says you're going to go up there and basically you're going to transfer the garments that aaron's wearing and put them on his son lsr and so he's going up this mountain and they're going up there it's almost like when you know abraham's taking his one and only son and where's the uh Where's the sacrifice, Dad? <laughs> it's like, this doesn't look good for me, right? Well, he had to have known why he was going up the mountain. All right, so just another opportunity, right? Moses takes him up there, Aaron dies, and they mourn him for 30 days. But guess what? Another opportunity for the sprinkling of the ashes again, because people are, people are dying, right? Miriam died, Aaron died, uh, and so it's... It's happening, and there's a reason why this huchat, this regulation, came into play. God wanted them to know how to deal with people who died and what to do, what not to do. Okay, so the the kind of the cool thing here, 
um, when he did die, Elazar did take his place, right? Um, but it's an important lesson for us to maybe catch on to. Um, we can be replaced. It's obvious. Uh, and, I've, and I've learned this throughout the years. And I even had a, uh, a chaplain friend of mine who told me something about 20 couple 24 25 years ago i can't remember but he's he actually did a demonstration he, he had a bucket of water right and he brought it up in front of everybody he goes okay he took his hand and he stuck it in the bucket of water right and then he pulled it out and then he says okay so do you see where my hand was no right because the water collapsed in where his hand was as soon as he pulled it out and that was that was an amazing thing because i was in a i was in a country well i wasn't in a country i was in a i was in alaska but i was so far away i was in the aleutian islands and everybody that went to this place was there for one year uh 300, 365 days and so we knew that we would be replaced right and everybody that came there was going to get replaced and so um but that's what we learn when elazar the son fills in as the high priest now is that Aaron could be replaced. And then eventually Elazar was going to be replaced. And, and that's how God sees it. But these replacements are only really possible when God's in control. If we don't ask God to take charge and be in control of things like that, then the replacement may never happen. And, and, or if it happens, it'll go the wrong way. So we know that the right person took the place of Aaron and uh, but God has to be in charge. Okay, so we're moving into the next chapter, twenty-one. And the king of Arad, he heard Israel was coming. Now, who knows what he heard? Like they're taking over everything. He decides he's going to approach them and attack them, and he does. They took prisoners. You would think, oh my gosh, that was sudden, right? Well, Israel goes, well, that wasn't good. So let's vow to Adonai. That's a good thing. He says, you know, we, we shouldn't vow, but if we do, we better keep them, especially this vow. If you will help us beat this king, uh, we'll completely destroy him and all that he has. Basically, God says, go for it. <laughs> and so they did, and it happened just like they thought it would. They defeated him. Well, you would think, well, things are going pretty good, right? Um but not, you know, what happens when things are going good? Israel loses sight of God's promises and all the good things that he's done for them. And they decided to complain again. And, uh, but it's time for them to learn a real valuable lesson uh, about not being impatient. And we can get impatient sometimes. We can want it now or want it quicker than we should be having it. So, they get very impatient, and uh, in Numbers 21, verses 4 and 5, it says that the people's temper grew short, and they spoke against God and Moses. So, I mean, we, we just got the detour, right? Go around Edom. You can't go through Edom. And now they're like, we don't have any real food here either. And we're out of water again, right? We're out of water again. And this stuff that we're eating, we're getting sick of, <laughs> really. I mean, we heard manna, right? They were eating that for years. Now they're getting sick of it, pretty sick of it. Well, um, they had to learn a lesson, right? So what does Adonai do? He sends poisonous snakes, <laughs> They probably thought this was really bad. Now we got these poisonous snakes coming and they're biting people and they're dying. Okay. So the snakes weren't just nipping at them. They were poisonous, right? You've heard about that. If you get bit by a poisonous snake, you better uh, administer anti-venom quick, real quick, and hope it doesn't reach the vitals like the heart, you know, or brain, or I don't know how fast, you know, your blood goes through your body. But if this poison gets through your body, it's going to do some, and it did, it killed a lot of people. And so the people start to admit, yeah, we sinned, we rebelled, please, Moses, help us. Uh, okay, I, I can do this. Um, but I don't know, he says, all right, I'm going to tell you what to do. And actually, this is a real easy one, right? He goes, 
make a serpent, you know, like the ones that are biting the people, uh, bronze, put it on a pole, you know, and put it where people can look at it from wherever they're at. They don't have to come up and bow down to it. No, just that they can look at it. That's why he says, put it on a pole. Look up and see this serpent. He says, if they look at it, they're going to remain alive if they get bit. So all they have to do is, where's that snake? You know, I just got bit. And so, because the snakes didn't just leave immediately. They had to put some of this into practice, some of this getting bitten. Uh, and I don't know how long that went on until the snakes all disappeared or they all, you know, got killed or something, but they could remain alive. But it had to take a little bit of faith, you know, I guess, you know, hopefully they didn't idolize that. <laughs> we don't know all of what could have happened, right? But this is another opportunity uh, that we can apply here, right? Uh, something that Yeshua told us, and it's in the book of John, chapter 3. And does anybody remember uh, a program on TV called Nick at Night? <laughs> Everybody remember that? Nick at All right, well, Definitely. Nick at Night. Yeah. So who's Nick at night in, in John chapter three, right? Nicodemus. Well, Nicodemus is having this little one-on-one -on -one with Yeshua. And as they're talking, you know, he says to him, uh, as Moses, this is right before John 3.16. It's like 14 and 15, right before John 3.16. Everybody knows that one, right? Just as Moses was lifted up, he lifted up the serpent in the desert. So must the son of man be lifted up. So I don't know if anybody watches the, that chosen series, you know, but anytime he mentions son of man, they know what he's talking about. <laughs> he's not just talking about a, an, an imaginary figure. He's talking about the, the Messiah. So the Messiah has to be lifted up so that everyone who trusts in him may have eternal life. So he was lifted up, right? Our, our Messiah was lifted up on, on a stake, and he was. And everybody who looks to him today has eternal life. You look to him, and you, and you ask him to come into your heart for forgiveness. So the lifting up. Okay, so that's John. But in 2 Corinthians, it also says in 5.21, um, God made this sinless man be a sin offering on our behalf, so that in union with him, we might fully share in God's righteousness. You don't get to share that if you're unrighteous or if you're not forgiven. So looking to him helps us share in that. Well, after much traveling, still continuing with the Parsha, after much traveling and camping and setting up tent and all, they come to a place where there's a well, Be'er, and... Uh, this is when Adonai tells Moses, I want you to assemble the people. I'm going to give them water. Okay, before we were trying to come up with a, a song, right? Spring up, oh well. They sang that song. It's right there in the Bible. So if you look at that chapter, you'll see it. Spring up, oh well. And, uh, and there's a couple more verses. And they're not the ones that we sing to that song most of the time. But I'll just say this, uh, I prefer that method of getting water. He saw the need, and he's not going to wait for them to complain this time. He just dealt with it, and I'm, I'm going to give him water right at this well. Well, summing up some of the Parsha, um, that mysterious concoction that we talked about in the very beginning, the red heifer, right, the cedar wood, the hyssop, and the crimson thread, um anybody who touched anybody who touched a dead person had to deal be dealt with this water solution in the ashes right so a little mystery but not a riddle in itself in the in the book of job job 14 verse 4 there's a question that's kind of asked and you know how some questions don't really need an answer what do we call those kind of questions um a what yeah rhetorical question rhetorical so the question was who can bring what is pure from something impure and then it says no one no one can do that right 
something that's pu something pure from what is unpure. It doesn't make sense, right? But we learned that this concoction, which takes everything that's not pure, you got ashes and and then somebody becomes pure. But as soon as they deal with it, that person is un un impure again. Well, there's a lot of pure and unpure going on, but who can do it? Nobody, but it's like the life out of death that Yeshua brought, right? By his death, which was what defeated death, and that's the worst enemy of all, right? Death. He defeated death. So he defeated death, and all who come to him for salvation also defeat death. So that's one of our great promises that Messiah gave us. We share in his life and defeating death because we come to him for his salvation. Um, in Hebrews 2, 14, it says, therefore, since the children share a common physical na nature as human beings, he, Messiah, Yeshua, became like them and shared that same human nature so that by his death, he might render ineffective the one who had the power over death. And that's the adversary. So that power, ineffective right now. All who believe and trust in Messiah. He doesn't have that power over us anymore. That's something to rejoice about. So, But this also gives us an opportunity to remember who is the giver of life and who is the God of the living, right? Yeshua reminded us in Matthew 22, he says, Matthew 22, 32, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, and the God of Yaakov. He says, he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. So all who call him God are living, not dead, living. So may look like dead over here, but in his realm, we're living. So it's obvious that what we saw in this Parsha that Moses blew it, right? He blew it. He didn't give God the glory. He had the opportunity. Just talk to the rock. God wanted to get his recognition by just a simple obedience from your servant, you know, your best friend, the guy who was so humble. He just wanted him to follow that instruction. So what can we learn from that? Well, follow his instructions, right? Don't take things, matters into your own hands and do what you think or let your anger get a hold of you. Um, and remember that our father is always the source of all blessings and provision that he gives to us. He's always the source. So we should never allow any recognition uh, to be directed to us, right? Because it's not about me not about you. It's not about any of us. It's about him and uh, that he gets all the praise. He gets all the glory and um, direct our praises to him in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you for joining Olive Tree Community Spokane for today's message. Join us for 24-7 Messianic music and teaching just like this on Messianic Joy Radio. Go to live365.com or download the app Live365 and search for Messianic Joy. Shalom from Olive Tree Community, Spokane.